Ya. Is it working? Yeah. Okay. Sorry? Yeah, it, it was, yeah. Welcome, everyone. The next talk is uh, by Samuel Thibault, if I pronounce yeah, correctly. Yeah, uh, he will tell us more about uh, the accessibility of, uh, of Debian. So thanks for coming. Um, so I will talk about accessibility um, in Debian. Uh, just to give a short answer, how accessible is Debian? I don't have, yeah. It's quite well accessible, but there are still some stuff to do. So that's why I'm here uh, to see what we can do and discuss about it. Um, uh, but just to give the outline of my talk, I will f of course uh, start with introducing you to accessibility because I guess uh, almost nobody had in this room has ever uh, seen accessibility problems. And then I will give you some state of the art of the current uh, techniques that are used uh, for accessing to uh, a computer. And about Debian, uh, what is already working, uh, what uh, we should do, and what we should do we don't necessarily know yet. Uh, it's about packaging and all things like this. So it's, it will be more a debate than um, solutions that I will provide. And so the focus is what can you do? and to help. Please, please ask questions. This is the first time I make uh, a talk about this topic, so I don't know what you don't know. So please ask me when uh, you don't understand something. And about Debian, please debate, uh, have ideas and things like this. Um, the little green and black thing uh, on top of, of the screen, don't look at it for now. Uh, I see it later. So. What is accessibility, which is also known as uh, A11Y, the usual uh, contraction algorithm. So it's making software uh, usable by disabled people. Uh, disabled means a lot of things. Uh, of course, the first example and the one I will uh, detail in this talk is blind people. So people who can't see at all. There are some people who are just low sighted. And for those people, uh, things that can be done, I just show. Uh, I won't talk so much about uh, that because I don't know so much. Ah, come on. Well, never mind. The problem with accessibility is quite recent, so it's quite bugged anyway. Um, so those people can still distinguish some things on the screen, but not everything. And so having just magnification helps them a lot. So this is the magnification the magnification of the GNOME desktop. And yeah, for instance, here you have a you know, part of QMU which is magnified. And of course, you can change the zoom factor uh, so that for people who really have hard time to see and have to go uh, right uh, at a few centimeters to the screen, uh, they can see better the, the screen. I have to disable it. So. But on not only these two kinds of uh, disease, deaf people, people who can't hear, uh, in a lot of games, uh, you need to hear to be able to kill the monsters, etc. Well, that's an accessibility problem. Sometimes you have uh, software that makes uh, sounds, etc. That's an accessibility problem as well. So that's a problem. Colorblind. Colorblind. Um, maybe you're not aware, I'm just curious how many people in this room are colorblind. 
And please raise your hand, don't be shy. I know at least two person. A third person? Okay. So you can see that even in this room, we are not so many, there are quite a lot of colorblind people. Uh, for this case, uh, things like composite, which is meant for 3D, etc., so very visually uh, things, uh, actually it can be used uh, for accessibility by just applying a filter on colors to make um, uh, to, to, to use more distinguishable colors, or just to simulate color blindness for those people who aren't. So just to, to know how it feels to be color blind. One handed, some people just have one hand, and so a uh, usual Azerty keyboard is not necessarily so so easy to use, and so then you have uh, key maps for such cases. Finger-handed, you only have one finger. Then you can still use a joystick. I will show you the kind of thing that you can still do uh, quite efficiently. Eye-handed, you just can move your eye. And still you can um, uh, use uh, eye-tracking uh, systems that just look at what you are looking at on the screen. And I show you the Dasher application, which is quite impressive. You have uh, all the um, the letters of the alphabet on the right, uh, and I start and just move my mouse to the H, the E, and then the double L, and you see it's very smart because it knows that a lot of words in English begins with e H, E, and then a double L, not only one. So the second L is made bigger. And then hello, and I go to the war, and you can see the the words just making, and I can't remember where. Yeah, it's it. And that's it. Well, I'm not very good at it because uh, I don't use it often, but people who use eye tracking systems are re really efficient at typing, just thanks to this. Uh, elderly people, uh, well, actually, that's a problem because usually they have all the problems. <laughs> and another problem is cognition. Well, of course, users are stupid. You, you all know that. But sometimes it's actually a disease like dyslexia or things like this that don't help at all uh, for using a computer. So I will not detail all of this. Um, there is a quite good how-to, which is a bit old, but that explains all of this quite well. and. Uh, different kinds of things that are needed. So I will focus mostly on blind people. Unless you have some questions about uh, dis um, disabilities in general. No? Okay. So, just a few technologies. Braille input and output for blind people, of course. I will detail this later. Um, there is speech synthesis, which is mostly you have text and then you have some software that converts it into uh, something you can hear. It used to be done in hardware, but now it's mostly done in software just because it's easier to, to give updates, it's less costly, etc. Um, joysticks, as I said, for people who can just move a finger uh, or just a press button, some people can just press something and then they can still select a row and then a column of a virtual keyboard and then type. So I would just focus on braille input output and speech synthesis. Uh, so braille devices. Um, so I don't have a braille device because as we will see, they are quite um, expensive. Um, but I have a photograph here, so you can see, oh no, it's not so good. But well, basically you have um, a flat line on which you have some pins that go up and down um, in a me mechanical way. And so when a pin is up, it's just like here, you have the little dots that are uh, black. And then for, well, it's not so simple, but you can think of it as for just a little cell like this, there is a letter. So actually this is Debian in Braille. And so 
you can just put several cells like this and put some buttons. Come on. And then you have a braille device. Mostly it's this, you have a series of braille cells, a few buttons to navigate, we will see how it works. And then that's a braille device. Uh, so just put it. So usually they are connected to the, uh, the computer through a serial line or USB or Bluetooth, whatever. And they have 12, 20, 40, 80 cells. Well, how much do you think this costs? Just 24 cells. It's not so much. It's, not, it's just a quarter of a usual TTY line. How much? I couldn't hear. A hundred? Thousand? More than a thousand. Three thousand. Three thousand and six hundred. A forty? Forty cents? Yeah, five and a half. And this one is forty as well, but it has a braille keyboard on it, and you can take notes uh, so that it's just personal computer in in uh, in a word. How much? Almost 10,000. And the price doesn't get down. It's always been like this for years, for decades. So, well, the idea is don't focus on just one technology. Just because Braille is not perfect, uh, well, not only it's expensive, but also a lot of people can't read Braille just because they got blind later in their life. And so it's quite hard to learn something uh, at some point or just because uh, it's too difficult. Uh, well, anyway, Braille is not perfect. Speech synthesis is not either, just because sometimes you are in a train, uh, you don't want to disturb people, um, or just because you're deaf, and then you can hear um, the speech. Um, a common pitfall, well, it's not necessarily a pitfall, is to write dedicated software uh, so that people can use um, uh, the, the computer. Well, these, Emacspeak and Firefox, are two examples. Well, they are not so, ma so much dedicated, dedicated software. It's an adaption of existing software to, for Emacspeak speaking and Vi Firefox as well. Um, there was quite some work in that, and it works quite great. Emacs is good in that, well, you can do everything with it. So people can do a lot of things with, the, with their computer thanks to this. Well, not JavaScript sites, so, well, you have Firefox for this, but then you don't have an Office suite opening um, uh, open Office documents, and so you need an Office suite, etc. So you have to re-implement re everything. Another thing is, you may also think about writing a web browser from scratch that speaks. Uh, the problem is that then your web browser won't be usable by sighted people. And then a sighted person and a non-sighted person cannot work together on the same, um, uh, with the same software. And that's a problem. When you work together, you want to show something on the screen, but Ah, no, but because it's the, the accessible version, so you can't, etc. So the idea is just make the existing application accessible without having to modify or as less as possible uh, so that you can just reuse the huge um, uh, amount of software that exists and um, work together with people. So that, for instance, here, uh, ideally, enough, I should be able to plug Braille device, and then on the Braille device you would see what is shown on the screen, so my presentation. Well, for now it's not working yet, but that's the kind of thing that we want. And then if I click, that should make the Braille device go to that part of the screen. So, um, just to explain how things are working, about, f uh, well, yeah, in a few words, uh, text mode in general is quite well accessible. Uh, just because it's text already, so it's not so difficult to access it. Uh, the problem is that, of course, beginners are afraid of text mode. So 
you need to have some um, uh, GUI accessibility. GNOME uh, started being accessible a few years ago. There's still a long road to go. And we are actually quite wait compared to the Windows case. Uh, JAWS, Windows Eyes, and etc. Uh, have been started quite a lot of time ago, and we are late. But well, so first, yeah. Uh, just uh, wonder uh, why the uh, we uh, would be less scary uh, for a blind beginner. Just because typing command lines, some people just can't. Uh, just don't want they they are well there is uh, I mean it's just the same for sighted people some sight people people just don't want to use command line just because oh it's so scary to type commands and you can't beat that yeah yeah uh, actually uh, usually I would use text mode but some people don't and it's a permanent uh, fight on the uh, accessibility mailing list uh, between people who prefer always prefer text mode and prefer people who prefer always prefer graphical interfaces just because it's more uh, intuitive etc even if it's graphical they find it more intuitive right. other questions no so the very technical part First, uh, the Linux console accessibility is relatively uh, simple. So you have Linux here with all the applications running on different VTs. And the Linux kernel has an interface so that a daemon, so for instance, Braid TTY, can just read what is displayed on the screen and then show it on a Braille device or speak it uh, through a synthesis. So, it's quite simply that you can just have you can just review the screen. When you go to X11, um, uh, no, sorry, there is another uh, way to do it: is to put the um, uh, the reader just between the application and the TTY layer. So that's what uh, Yasa uh, does. Um, it is actually a very portable way because PTY exists in all kinds of Unices. And so it doesn't depend on Linux. So that's quite cool. Now, about the graphical mode, that's kind of a problem. Quite a long time ago, the Mercator project uh, just uh, was just sitting between the application and the X server and getting the text uh, on the way. That works for Xedit, but that doesn't for Gedit, just because Gedit doesn't send text to the server, but pix maps, because the rendering is done inside the application. And so here, it can't work anymore. And so you have to use what we call nowadays the ATSPI, which is an interface to let a screen reader like Orca access to the information, the textual information, right inside the uh, toolkit that is used by uh, the application. And then you can output uh, uh, as Braille or speech, etc. So that's basically how you can access applications. Okay? So, technically speaking, a lot of applications are already accessible. So, console, you know, GTK, because it, uses, it presents a NetASPI interface, KDE 4, but not yet, uh, KDE 3, Acrobat Reader. Um, added a NetASPI interface uh, some years ago, as opposed to XPDF. XPDF draws the image itself, so you don't get the text, and it doesn't uh, yet use uh, ATSPI, and other toolkits like uh, XT, etc. So this is just about technique. But then, in practice, a lot of applications still aren't accessible, just because the way they work. So for instance, here um, I have a Linux um, uh, machine. Uh, I just make it bigger. Uh, for you to see. And I'll add.
Yeah, I'm waiting for it to reappear. Well, why doesn't it reappear? <coughs> ah, demo effect. Okay. So th this is a different layout of keys uh, that I use for testing because it has a lot of, of things. And while it's booting, I will show you the basic principle of um, browsing in the screen. Ah, come on. Yeah. Come on. So slow. I'm just enabling um, a highlight so you can see what's happening. So on the Braille device, you can see that what is shown is the line on which the cursor is. And you can see that uh, it is highlighted. Oh, sorry, you can't because it's too low. Here it is. And so if I type things, uh, automatically when it goes off, then the Braille display follows what happens. Now, if I run, for instance, Omics, which is a text mode application for tuning um, the audio levels. Well, by default, you get the uh, what's uh, the the current level. But if I go down with the key, with the arrow key, the braille does device doesn't follow, just because the cursor of the application doesn't go down. There's a little uh, there's a little um, less than sign which goes, but. It, it doesn't. It's not useful for the um, the screen reader. So this application is not so much accessible, and this is actually uh, always the problem. It's just stupid details like this uh, which are needed to fix. Another example here is just um, a dial box in which you have a uh, field and which is a label and a field, and sometimes yeah. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, just wait, X1 there. Uh, up. Yeah, that's it. So here you have a, um, a dial box with labels and fields. What often happens is that you first put labels and then the fields, and then in the screen reader program, you first see the labels and then the fields, and you don't know which fields corresponds to which label. And it's just stupid thing like this. So, come on. So just like CSS, just don't think about um, visual layout. Just think logical order. For text applications, put the cursor in the right place uh, automatically, and just talk with the users to know what would be needed. And if you're crazy enough, just use the accessible software. So, how about Debian? I won't show the Debian installer bit because it takes some time, but it just works from the start. You boot with the CD-ROM, you plug the, the, the USB device, and then it works. You can access it. You can install Debian by yourself. This is really great. Um, you can test it if you want. It's broken, but uh, it should be fixed. Um, for now, speech is not supported. That would mean need some support. And 
adding a TSPI support would allow uh, a lot of other technologies to work. About the Debian distribution, just to emphasize the need for a text application, always provide text equivalents of tools, so please package them. So now about the IDs, um, there are already tags, uh, interface text mode or UE toolkit GTK that already provides a good uh, clue about uh, whether it is accessible. We could add some uh, special tags accessible with, which would express that a package can be used um, through a TTR and TTY screen reader or provides an ATSPI interface. And even further, you could even have a tag that says a user tested it with, uh, for instance, GNOME Orca and said that, yeah, it was accessible. And so for the user, he can quite quickly select uh, the, um, uh, the application, the packages, according to what works. Um, even further, we could ask a task cell element to the uh, Debian installer that would automatically select the accessibility packages and tune the little stupid parameters that helps accessibility. Or even meta package, I, well, this has to be discussed. We we'll see. In more generally, uh, not only packaging, uh, well, please subscribe to Debian Accessibility in your, if you are in, interested in, please join, please help. Uh, a lot of help is needed. Um, we could also, for instance, add an accessibility chapter to the installation manual. Uh, actually, I wonder why it's not here already. But there was also an idea maybe to add just a chapter to the um, a new maintainer's guide. Just like a lot of st stuff like uh, interna internationalization and things like this, well, this is one of the items that developers should be aware of. And even more generally, please be kind and patient with the blind people. The problem is that it's difficult for them to use the software. It's even more difficult to explain the problem they are having. For instance, you may uh, I said it um, a few minutes ago, Braille doesn't follow. That doesn't mean anything to a, a usual developer. And you, please d just discuss, a, um, forward to the Debian accessibility list so to get uh, some other people and then understand that it just means that the cursor of your applications is not put at the interesting place and so the screen reader doesn't automatically know the place that is interesting. So. It's just as simple as this. And uh, yeah, you can con contact uh, your blind institute if you mm, maybe want to discuss with people interested in, um, in, computer in computers and Debian, for instance. Uh, that should help a lot, just having free software in the um, blind uh, community and as well have blind uh, community into free software. So just as a conclusion, um, so accessibility is important. Debian is quite is is one of the leaders in accessibility, but we should do better, I think. So you have all sorts of resources on a, a website which is not related only to Debian. That's why it's not on the Debian website. Um, so that's it. So if you have questions, please do ask. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can just install the package. The problem is it's, it's rela relatively old. I mean, the GNOME Orca uh, software is um, being developed really, really fast. And so uh, to make it simple, just install the package. And you have a not so old version, but still a bit old. Um, if you really want to get the latest version, you have to reinstall GNOME by hand, mostly. Just because to get the latest fixes, accessibility fixes, you need the newest GNOME version, etc. That's kind of a problem, but at least the simple solution exists, yeah. Mm. Other questions? No? I think we've, uh, okay. we've run out, out of time. If you have more questions, yeah. you can, of course, uh, contact yeah, yeah, please do. Mm -hmm. in person. Thank you. Thanks.
Uh, in a few minutes we will have Holger Lefsen talking about uh, Debian Edu in Debian Main.